Welcome to Shattered Reality with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Hey, hello. Uh, we are again missing Kate Valentine here on Shattered Reality. This is Farusha, and we are hoping that she will join us before the hour is over. Uh, and she promises to try to join us before the hour is over. I wanted to mention something that happened this past week. I received on our Shattered Reality podcast Facebook page a lovely note it came as a message from a woman in Australia, and she was enjoying our podcast. And I wrote back to her, and I told her that I was so happy she was listening, and I listed a couple of our Australian guests. Well, I sent it off to her, and for some reason, Facebook, in all its wisdom and insanity erase the message that she sent me. And so I wanted to give her a little shout out here and thank her for her message, and she will know who she is. Uh, and if memory serves me correctly, her name is Maxine. But memory may not serve me correctly since Facebook deleted the lovely message. In any case, lovely lady from Australia, we're glad you're listening. And we hope you can get some of your friends to listen as well. And maybe we'll have Mary Rodwell on again soon, or one of our other Australian guests. In any case, um, today we are going to be talking to a gentleman who wrote a wonderful book and produced a movie called Flipside. Both the movie and the book are called Flipside. Uh, he has been involved with the Life Between Life movement, uh, which was started by the recently late uh, Mr. Newton uh, there, Michael Newton, and he passed away within the last six months. And um, we are truly sorry that he's gone. Uh, but now, let's have our guest today, Richard Martini. Hello, Richard. Without further ado. Hi, how are you doing? I'm Perusha? doing well. And guess who just walked in? Oh, she's here. She's Thank here. Thank gosh. The saucer just landed. <laughs> the saucer just landed outside. And uh, we thought that she go. was perhaps uh, going to be spending the afternoon on Mars. But no, Kate Valentine is here yes. with us. And I just introduced... Rich Martini and Hi, Kate. She hasn't got her headset on yet, but she's she's there. she's going to be there I'm in a second. Okay, Kate. So, so why not start out, Rich, okay. um, by telling us a little bit about um, what brought you to the uh, uh, Michael Newton Life Between Life uh, movement? Well, as many people who come to this kind of work, and I'm sure you've heard this before, uh, it was the death of a friend. A close friend of mine passed away, her name is Luana Anders, and she passed away in 1996. And she had these recurring dreams before she passed that she was in what she said, another universe, <laughs> where she was in a classroom filled with people uh, teaching something spiritual. She said it was a language she never heard before, but somehow she completely understood. At the time, I thought, oh, that's the morphine drip talking. But when she passed away, a close friend of hers called me and said, I had this great dream about Luana last night. She's in the fourth dimension in a classroom dressed in white, and everybody there seems to be dealing with spirituality. And I, at the time, I thought, classrooms in the afterlife. What? But she started appearing to me in dreams. And at first I thought, well, this is unusual because she was appearing as younger than I knew her. And then a little bit later on, I was living in New York City and I had a profound out-of-body experience. Monroe, I'd, re I'd read a little bit about Robert Monroe's work and I'd actually 
um, had a few experiences in my lifetime. That's why I read about it, you know, out floating around the room. But in this case, I found myself shooting into deep space. Wow. Leaving Manhattan like the powers of 10, not knowing where I was going, seeing light going past me so fast that it was melting, going through some kind of a wormhole. I, I didn't know what that was. I'm just saying that was the experience. And when I got to the other side, I was traveling. Instead of this way, I was traveling this way. And when I stopped, there was my friend Luana. And her eyes were closed. And she opened them as if to say, you were looking for me. Here I am. And at that moment, some guy outside my apartment honked his truck horn. (laughs) So, But the unusual part was I had the experience of coming back like a rubber band pulling me. Yes, absolutely. So within... A few splits, a split second before the guy's hand came off the horn, I made that trip back. I saw Manhattan coming up at me in this incredible rate of speed and then woke up in my bed. And when I stepped out of the bed, I thought, okay, I had that experience. I don't know what it was. And it, that's really what started my journey. I ran into Michael Newton's work some years later, talking to a friend, and, uh, and I opened up his book, Journey of Souls, and the first chapter was a guy under deep hypnosis saying, I'm in a classroom, everyone's dressed in white, it seems to be a class in spirituality. I thought, well, wait, uh, this might be interesting, maybe I could make a documentary about this topic. So I called up the Newton Institute, they said, well, Michael's retired, he doesn't really do interviews anymore. However, he said, you could come and film one of our conferences. I thought, well, that's great. I was surprised that they were going to let me do that, but they did. Paul Oren, the former president of the Newton Institute, invited me. So I flew to Chicago, my hometown, and I started filming what they were doing in their workshops, people under deep hypnosis. And by the end of that week, they said to me, Rich, why don't you try it? And I thought, okay, well, that's the George Plimpton School of Journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, try it out yourself. And I thought, why not? I can prove it to be inaccurate because I hadn't come to do a session. I didn't believe in past lives. I wasn't. I didn't think I could be hypnotized, which is really just like a guided meditation. But so I tried it, and then four hours later, I felt like I had taken the red pill. Wow! <laughs> because I had the same experience that all the people that I had read about, but it was different, of course. It was unique to me and my journey. So since then, I've been like an addict, and I've been filming people under deep hypnosis. By the time I wrote Flipside and made the film Flipside, I had done 12, filmed 12 sessions. I had done two. Since then, I've filmed 45 sessions. I've done five. And then I've moved the research a little bit because I took my reports to the University of Virginia, uh, the Department of Perceptual Studies. UVA, uh, yes. UVA, you know them well, because the Monroe Institute was there, weren't they? Yes, or they still they, are? Well, I, I, they sort of uh, cooperate one with the other. Yeah. Um, some of the people on the board are with... Uh, uh, Oh. Division of Perceptual Studies. Right. One of our early guests, Ross Dunseeth, uh, is on the board, and uh, we, we've had uh, Michael Grosso from there, and a couple of other people who are at uh, UVA uh, uh, Department of Perceptual Studies. Well, I hadn't planned on presenting my case to these scientists. It was one of those weird non-coincidental things that occur in life, where someone had invited me to speak in Virginia Beach at the INS Institute, the International Association of Near-Death Studies. Mm -hmm. And this person was friends with Dr. Bruce Grayson, who was part of the UVA program, DOPS, and we stayed at his house. And I, in advance of going to see him, I read about him and I realized, wow, you know, this is a fascinating topic. So he asked me to send uh, send him like a dozen books and flip side. And so everyone in his department read it. And when I arrived, they said, okay, we got a conference and you're speaking. <laughs> and, so, and, you know, I drove over there and, and for two hours, these guys grilled me. And it was fascinating because they started with uh, science doesn't consider hypnosis a valid scientific tool. And I 
thankfully, had read in Stevens' comments. Stephen Stevenson was the guy at, yes. uh, at UV who had done the reincarnation studies. I'd already read his comments, his commentary about hypnosis. And I was able to say, I agree with you 100%. The efficacy of what someone is saying under hypnosis could be taken apart because of a variety of reasons. However, you have thousands of people across the globe saying the same things consistently about the journey. It doesn't matter what their religion, their background, their gender, where they came from. They're saying the precisely same things. That's a data set. And I said, it's not up to me as a filmmaker to prove why that is true. I said, it's up to you guys. You're the scientists. Right. And then I, I made this challenge. This was back in 2011. I said, look, take a Michael Newton trained hypnotherapist. I recommend them because I'm familiar with what they do. And take anybody and see if they get to the same places that I'm telling you they're going to get to. And if they don't, then we're done. Can you? But if they but if they do, then it's up to you guys to demonstrate why that is. Can you describe I, uh, for our listening audience, since um, we have sure. already seen your movie and I've read parts of uh, Michael's books, um, can you describe the experience, a general way, what would happen in the life between lives? Sure. <laughs> the Absolutely. person dies and then... So, no, and they, are, they are consistent. And look, Michael, I can tell you Michael Newton was a skeptic about this. He didn't believe in the afterlife or past lives. He just didn't believe in it until a client on his chair, that he had said to him, the guy had come in with psychosomatic pain on his shoulder. And, the, and so he said to the guy, take me to the source of your pain while he was under hypnosis. And the guy said, oh, I'm a German I'm a British soldier fighting in World War I, and I'm being stabbed by a German soldier. Michael didn't believe him, so he made him give him his name, rank, serial number, his mother's maiden name, the address of the house he grew up in. And afterwards, the guy's pain went away, called him and said, I just want to thank you. And Michael wasn't satisfied with that, so he wrote to the British War Office, and they reported that, indeed, this guy had lived. So he opened his practice to talking to people under deep hypnosis about previous lifetimes. And it was somewhere in the 60s, a woman came in who was very depressed about her current lifetime. He saw it as a case of depression, but he said to her, take me to the source of this loneliness. And she said, oh, I'm with my soul group. We're discussing my lifetime, and we've all agreed to be apart this time, and that's why I feel so lonely. And then she went, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm cured. You've helped me. But in his case, he was stunned by what she was saying. He had taken extensive notes, and he basically closed his public practice, and for the next 30 years, only spoke to people who could take him to this particular environment, which he dubbed the Between Lives Realm. And he had according to him, over 7,000 cases over the course of 30 years. But in my research, I found that Dr. Helen Wambaugh, 10 years earlier, had had the same results with her work. Now, so wasn't she, is, in, is Helen valid. Wambaugh, isn't that the woman with, um, with the book? Um, didn't, isn't she? Life Before Life. Yeah, that's one of her books. She's written a couple. There was somebody who took over her work and finished her work, so I, I don't know about those books. I'm just... I've read all of her cases and examined them, and they're identical to what Michael Newton says in his cases, which are, in essence, we choose our lifetimes. But let me get back to the, the original thing so I can just tie this part together. Sure. Once I read that part of my friend's journey, these classrooms, I thought, and they offered this session to me, I went to classrooms. I had the experience of going into classrooms and seeing my friend in the classroom and her reaction to seeing me appearing before everyone in class like a hologram and looking at me like, what are you doing here? And me trying to explain what I was doing there because I was talking out loud to the hypnotherapist. But everyone in the classroom was looking at me like, why are you interrupting our class? It was a really odd construct. Let's just put it that way. If it had been imaginary, it wouldn't have made any sense. But in my case, I was able to 
And I've been back to this classroom many times. I've, like I said, I've done five of these sessions so far. And what I've found is that you can, anyone can travel in to visit your soul group, your council, your, meet your guides, find out why you chose this lifetime. It's great stuff. Well, what, what exactly are they teaching in these classrooms? I'm sorry? What are they teaching in the classrooms? What are they teaching? All right. Uh, be, let me, before I get to that, okay. I want to go back to your other question, which was, what's the process? So, and we'll get to the classroom in a okay. second. So, what's okay. the process? The process is very simple in a nutshell. The hypnotherapist spends the first half an hour to an hour walking you through your own life and getting you to talk about it. Let's go back to a memory when you were 10 or 11 years old. Let's go back to when you were five. What comes to mind? What do you see? Where do you live? Details that you would know, but I've, you have this unusual experience of walking through your house when you were 10 and how it looked then and the emotions of what that was like. But that's, that's just the process. Eventually they say, let's go back to your first memory, some really early memory. Uh, then they'll say, and now we'd like to go to a previous lifetime that has some significance to this one. That's key, because people remember previous lives all the time and aren't really sure why. But in this case, they've asked you, let's go to something that has significance to this life. So people then start to, they're asked the question, where are we? Are we inside? We're outside? Are, we, are you tall? Are you short? Is it day? Is it night? They're all neutral questions by design. So you're doing the guiding. You're the one who's taking the person on the trip. And now you go through a previous lifetime, whatever it is, you examine it, and eventually you get to the end of that lifetime. And when you get to the end, they ask the question, now where would you like to go? I've filmed 45 of these. People always say, I want to go home. They don't mean home of the lifetime of this life, and they don't mean the lifetime, the home of the lifetime they've just remembered. They mean home, as in not here. So these people claim consistently that when you go back there, you see all your lifetimes, you will get to understand that your consciousness, you only bring about a third to your life, to this particular lifetime. The two thirds is always back there. So when you leave here, whether you've died or whether it's a consciousness altered event, you go back and reconnect with your consciousness. And now you can access all this information that normally is not accessible, except unless you've had a near-death event or something like that. Are you guys still there? Yes, yep, we're yep, still no, there. We're, we're, listening. We're, we're listening. We're definitely <laughs> listening. Not really I was like, what's going on over there? No, anyway. no, we were, we were listening very closely. I, I have a couple of questions. And before I ask my questions, I want to explain two things. Um, the first thing is um, that we are very open-minded, but we do tend to be slightly skeptical, only in a, a very healthy way. I don't. Ha I try not to hold a belief unless I've experienced it. So I guess you could say, and I don't know if this is true of, of Kate as well, but I am a Gnostic with a small g. In other words, I don't uh, follow any uh, specific Gnostic Christian rituals or anything like that, but I am a Gnostic with a small g, meaning that I kind of believe that almost anything might be possible, but I don't believe it when somebody tells me. I also don't disbelieve it, okay? So you know where I'm coming from and that we're on the same page, all right? Sure. And the second thing that I wanted to mention is how I came to uh, the Michael Newton material. Mm. I have a client of many years, uh, at least 15 years, this individual has been my client. And mm -hmm. I would say about three or four years ago, she came in with a book of, of Michael Newton's. She had read two of them and... Uh, she also had an audio presentation that he made of one of his books that was abridged. And uh, she said, you have to read this. I'm really interested in this, and I want to know what you think. And um, so I read 
the book and I listened to the audio presentation and I was petrified. <laughs> And I want to explain why I was petrified. Now, you have been down to um, uh, the DOPS, uh, the, SV, uh, the UVA DOPS. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know that I often go to the Monroe Institute. And you may remember in the writings of Mo Robert Monroe, he speaks about the belief system territories. Uh, which is, and just for, you may know what it is, but for our listeners, the belief system territories are where he saw that people went after they died. Now, granted, I don't just take his word as the law or the fact, but he had a very interesting proposition, and that is that whatever you expected to happen in the afterlife would happen in the afterlife and that there there are ways to go beyond like if you were a, like a, um, uh, a, a, a uh, let us say an orthodox jew you might expect something different than if you were um, a, a catholic or if you were a buddhist and that people go to those heavens that they kind of expect or th those well, situations allow, allow me to comment on that okay. as i as my old Oxford-trained professor, Julian Baird, used to say to me, Richard, I'd agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong. Okay. I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of people's <laughs> own beliefs and their opinions about stuff that happens. In my case, I try to focus on eyewitness reports. So even in the case of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, let's give that as an example, it's a wonderful primer for understanding what happens in the death process, and you'll find that hospice care people have the same sort of list of things that happen. However, it was written by one person, Padmasambhava was the guy who wrote that. And thousands of people have commented on it, but it was his own experience. Right. So when you have a near-death event, and I've spoken to many, many people who have, they have their own unique experience. And you would assume that then, therefore, everybody has their own unique experiences. And they wouldn't coincide or they wouldn't line up or match. What I focus on is when people report the matches, the corroborating testimony. And I started with people having these between-life experiences, hypnotherapy. Like this, again, I've examined thousands of cases in film 45. Everybody does have their own experience that they see and experience during that, but there are hallmarks. So, for example, having a guide. Everybody's got a guide. People may wish that they don't, but they do. There's nobody that's ever come along and said, you know, I don't have a guide. Everyone's got a spirit guide. Everyone's got a soul group. Some, it's, Newton found that it was between 3 and 25 people in the soul group. I've taken people who are total skeptics, don't believe in anything religious, atheists, agnostics, a Buddhist, Muslim, doesn't matter. What I found, actually, in this research is that all religions are inaccurate in terms of this journey. There's none that actually state or claim or are even close to what people over there are saying about what happens. And I compare their reports. So, you have libraries that people see. We've heard that term, Akashic libraries, but Absolutely. people see them. Yes. But they never see the same library, you see? So, it can't exist per se. There's no two libraries that are identical. They're always different. So, yes, people do experience these things from their own frequency, however their receiver is built to, to experience things. However, you can say there is a library. So I, what I'm talking about is these things that are consistently reported. And I, it's not my appear, opinion or theory or belief that they're reported. I'm just reporting that. Okay. So I was, I was going to say that um, there is certain... Um, there are certain, um, not synchronicities, certain uh, things in common with um, what Robert Monroe reported and things that I have experienced both at the Monroe Institute and outside of the Monroe sure. Institute. Sure. Uh, I know, starting I, I with, work, starting you know. with uh, facing a council, 
uh, you know, sort of going into a very deep meditational state and facing a council. I've also gone on journeys with um, Natalie Sudman while I was there because we were roommates and we ended up going to the same place, even though we weren't talking about it beforehand. We compared our uh, journey afterwards and it was very similar. So, um, you know, I'm well, open to all this for stuff. One second. Bruce, let me interrupt sure, you sure. for one second. So you've seen your council. I didn't. I, I saw a group of people. It was like standing in the center of a stadium, and they were up on. on um, you know, they were up on the uh, the bleachers or up on the. Uh, Hang on. Hold yeah. on one second. Hold on. And this is what I've been doing for the past three years: talking to people about their councils. Okay. Without you being under hypnosis, but can you remember where you were standing when you saw these people? Yes. Okay. How far away were they? Um, a good distance. Um, 50 yards, I, I, 100 I'm, yards. I'm going to say if it was a softball field and I was standing on the pitcher's mound in yeah. a softball field, not a baseball field, a softball field, and there were some some seats raised above, uh, above me, uh, in the front of me, and I was there. Okay. Would you like to go there again? Uh, not this minute, but yes. Why not? <laughs> because we're, Why not? On, we're Why not? on the air. What do you say, Kate? Oh, go done, for it. I've, I mean. I've, done this, I've done this a dozen times on the air. Okay, you, let's do it. Let's you go do to it. my website, Martini Prods, at uh, YouTube. You'll see. I did it with Dr. Drew. I did it with everybody. Yes. So go I'm ahead. just asking. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's unusual that people actually have an eyewitness account that they can access in their mind. It's not my account. It's yours. Right. But I can ask you questions, and we can stop at any time. But sure. I'm just saying, why not? Here we are. Let's okay, go. Okay, let's go for right? it. Anybody could. So I want you to, in your mind's eye, take a photograph. She, um, she's not going to do anything weird, thing. is she? So you're standing on the mound, yes, and you're looking at these the stands, right? Yes, the stands. Okay. And stands. what's interesting is that there was a there was no lower stand, like as opposed to like a small, let's say a minor league baseball stadium right. or something right. like that. There, uh, I, there were. Tiers. I think you were a baseball player to past life. I'm kidding. I so, could have been. All right. I don't know. So in that mind's eye, you're frozen that frame, okay, right. and now. What I'm trying to point out to people is that memory is holographic. It retains all of the details, including multiple levels of details. So freeze the frame, and okay. I want you to now go forward closer to the stands. Allow yourself in your mind's eye to walk a little bit closer, 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 until they're only a few feet away from you. Can you do that? I don't think I can get that close. Um, How close can you get? A little I can, closer? A little, yes, I can get a little closer, but I come upon the place, as I was mentioning to you, that would be the first row of seats or the first okay. tier of seats, and instead there is like a what appears to be a wooden wall there, and they appear to be above that. Okay, do me a favor, go to that wall. Okay, I'm there. See, You see me? I'm getting closer to the wall. And I want you to look up and eyeball how many, count, how many people are here? Um, I would say seven or eight. Very good. Hold that thought. Seven or eight. I know you've never done this before, but we're going to have some fun. Okay. Okay? And think of this as a game, because this is not so serious, because your council knows what I'm doing. <laughs> I've done this before. They know I'm the guy who walks people up to visit their council. They know what I'm doing. It's okay if you don't. All right. So, I'm cool. When you look from left to right, just focus on the far left person, person over there on this side. Is that a male, a female, or neither or both? I would say that it is a male, but I would say... Almost like a non-sexual male. Okay, so male, le more you know, more male than female, but I get Male -ish, it. That's why I am. like sort of like one thinks of an angel so as being. Fo sort focus of. on him for a second, okay? Right. 
And again, we're not under hypnosis. We could be drinking coffee, water. We're, I'm not putting you under hypnosis. I'm right. just asking. All right? So I want you to focus on that dude. What's he wearing? And if he's wearing anything, how old is he? And what is, Does he have facial hair? Color his eyes? Okay. Um, I would say that, there, it, they, that he and they both... Everybody is a a white figure, and I don't mean that they're a Caucasian. I just mean that they're shimmering. Dressed in white? Or shimmering. Shimmering okay, white, good. probably dressed in white as well, but shimmering white. So it's more of a light experience than anything else. Yes. All right. But I'm going to ask him a question. All right. First, I want to ask if it's, do I have his permission to ask him a question? Can I ask him a question? And what's what's the response that you get? Um, I sort of get he sh he shrugs like ah oh, all right very good all right which means <laughs> eh go ahead yeah. we'll see eh. where we get yeah <laughs> all right I'm gonna ask you a question my friend and again I appreciate your being here in her memory and allowing us to ask you this question would you do me a favor and put in her mind's eye a name your first name whatever we can use to communicate with you and it's whatever comes into your mind michael Bruce. michael all right very good thank you michael very good can i call you mike no all right Michael. <laughs> let me ask you this question it's a very simple question i want you to put in farusha's mind how you earned this place on her council what's a word that comes to mind that represents why michael is on this council this is very weird. Not really. Um, the, the word that came to my mind is something that I mostly don't do. I mean, I've done it maybe twice in my life. And the word is skiing. Skiing. Yes. All right, very, very good. That's a funny, it's a funny concept because it's not, I have to ask Michael, what do you mean by that? Do you mean literally skiing or are you talking about a metaphor? Um, it appears that he is saying to me that it's coasting downhill. Ah, thank you, Michael. It's a metaphor. So it's not so much about the physical. Uh, well, take a look a little bit closer. So this light that's from Michael, is it a flat light or is it multicolored or does it glow or describe the light? What's the quality of the light? The, the light is bluish white and it is contained it's the kind of light you might think that you would see it like sort of spilling over or that it would cast a shadow but no it does not it's contained okay michael i want you to do us a huge favor i don't know if this is possible but we can ask would you do me a favor and allow her to take your hand? I know you guys are a distance apart, but in her mind's eye, I just want her to take your hand. Can you do that? Can you let her take your hand? Can you can you reach out in your mind's eye and hold Michael's hand? I've reached out in my in my physical body with my hand out. Okay. What's the sensation or emotion or feeling when he takes your hand? Strength. Oh. Wow. Strength. That's interesting. Okay. So, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. You've, you earned her, your place on her council through your strength, as well as her ability to, to coast, because coasting doesn't necessarily, it's not a pejorative. No. It could be to allow things to go by you that have no really important thing. Is, is that correct, Michael? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, I'm going to do something weird. Michael, thank you. I appreciate it, bro. Let's go to the next person over. We won't go through all seven or eight because we could, but let's just go to the next person over. Is that a male or a female? Hmm. I'm going to say it's a female. Okay, very good. Let me ask her, is it okay if I have a conversation with you? We're doing this live on the air to help sure, people. Sure, sure. Sure. Do me a favor. Can you tell me your 
first name or some name that we can use to just converse with you? Um, her, the name that she's giving me is Gloria, like, um, but, but sort of sung out. Oh, very good. All right. I love that. Do you see any kind of a, a clothing or, a, let's say, an article on her body of any place, or is it just light? Um, it's, it's, it's white. There's white, like what would, you know, if I look, trying to see something of that nature, I would say it's um, white, uh, soft white cloth. Oh, is, is she wearing anything on that cloth? Like jewelry or icons or... No, so, no. No, okay. Uh, just, just, uh, just, just edging this sort of, sort of some edging on the cloth. Very good. Gloria, I'd sing your name, but I don't want to scare people. But Gloria, tell us, what is the quality that you possess that earned you to be on our Friends Council? Softness. Softness. Could you explain that, Gloria? What does that mean? And what does that mean in terms of Farouche's path and journey? Malleability. Can you show her a lifetime? Can you show Farusha, Gloria, can you show Farusha a lifetime where she learned that malleability? Just a glimpse? Okay. What comes to mind? Being a fish. Oh, all right, very good. Now, I would point out that people report lifetimes in other realms on planets where they're underwater. And I'm going to guess that this is what she's showing you. Is that accurate, Gloria? Would you tell her yes or no? Sort of. Sort of. I'm just saying it's not a fish from this planet. Oh, is I, that correct? I don't know. I'm not getting that. Uh, I'm, okay, I'm asking Gloria. Okay. She knows. Gloria, is this a fish lifetime that she experienced here on this planet or some other planet? What she's showing me is almost like a very attractive eel, a, um, a, an, an iridescent eel. Very with, good. With with scales. And Gloria, would you put in her mind's eye where this place is in the universe? Is it in our universe? No. Okay, thank you. That's what I'm asking. You don't have to identify it. It's a little bit complicated. <coughs> but I just wanted you to be clear because you could walk away going, I was a fish in a past life. What was that about? I'm never eating salmon again. I'm just saying she's shown you something really unique. You experience a life somewhere else, not in this realm, that was a water-like environment. And we don't have to judge it. I would, if we asked about it, I would bet that it was a higher intelligence. Yes, yes. Okay, I, I was already you. told that uh, I was very intelligent, um, fish-like character. Thank you. I've inter I interviewed a guy in my book, Flipside. He's not in the movie, but he's in the book who normally incarnated on some other planet. He described this very unusual, it reminded me of the movie Arrival, you know, yes. what he was describing, and very highly intelligent. So I, I try not to judge any of these questions. So, but all right, back to your counsel for a second. Um, you got seven or eight. Yes. What I learned is that people earn these people, like they've gone through a difficult lifetime. So far we learned that you you know how to skate, ski, right? Uh, actually, avoid, I can't in this life, but... Uh, avoid stress. Avoid stress. You know yes. how to do it. Yes. You can tap into it any time. Michael can always help you if you ask him. Gloria has shown you a lifetime where something really unusual, but you learned... What was it you learned in that life? Malleability. Malleability. I mean, it's such an unusual term. Never heard it before, <laughs> but I understand it. Malleability. Ability to shift with difficulties that come forward. All right. We could go over each one, but I'm going to ask now, is there a spokesperson for your group? And if 
that person could come forward to okay. talk to us. A male, a female, or somebody, neither or both. We have someone here who is showing themselves to be like an older man, but it, it, I'm getting that that's just for show. Okay, very good. Listen, I was having a conversation with uh, a hypnotherapist that I work with, a guy named Scott DeTamble out here in L.A. Yes. In Claremont. He's very good. He was trained by Michael Newton. And he said, you know, Rich, it's very unusual. People present themselves as these kind of old, sage, bearded, you know, the wizard hat, fantastic robes, with beautiful light. And then Scott will ask him, can you show me what you look like to yourself? And often they're light. It's a version of light. And as Scott put it so succinctly, everyone's a blob of light. We just wear these different costumes so that we can present ourselves in a certain way. So that's not a pejorative. I'm just saying thank you for this, for this gentleman to present himself in this way so that we can converse with him. Can I ask you for a name that you might, so at least I can have a conversation with you? Uh, he's telling me Isaac. Isaac. Very good. Isaac, nice to meet you, dude. Now, if I could get some lottery numbers. I'm kidding. <laughs> Isaac, if you could put it. Our, so let me ask you, Isaac, how is our friend Farusha doing? Look what she's doing. She or she is talking to millions of people on the planet with her podcast. Would you tell her how she's doing? How do you think she's doing? He says she's hanging in there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not so not so generous with the compliments, but we'll take whatever we can get. Can you put in her mind's eye uh, something that she's done in her lifetime that you guys in the council thought she had accomplished that was a good thing? What would that be? Hmm. Could be any time in your life. Something pops to your mind. Uh, just uh, pursuing uh, pursuing education. Pursuing education. Okay. So that's so. Why was that a valuable thing to show her, Isaac? Just to let her know it was worthwhile. Very good. Is there any now? Let me ask you. Could you do me a favor and put a sensation somewhere in Farusha, somewhere head to toe, a physical sensation that embodies? your ability to touch her frequency? Uh, it's tingling in the bottom of my feet, which is something that I, Farusha, do to ground myself. Often I concentrate on the soles of my feet, and when you said that, I got just the tingling Sensation. in the soles of my feet. Right. Okay, very good. Uh, listen, I, you know, anyone could argue that I planted that idea, but I've never heard of such a thing, so I think that's wonderful. What I've learned, and Isaac, correct me if I'm wrong, but this kind of amplification of a signal is to let you know, not only are you always with someone, you're always guarded. You're always, you have people who are watching over you at all times, but also that they're accessible. So when you want to speak to Isaac, or Gloria, or Michael, <laughs> sorry, I hope the council's not upset. No. But, but the idea that you can talk to them, this is a way of you accessing information from them. Now, while we're here, here we are. Let's look around. Is your, is your guide here, Farusha? Have you met your guide before? No. Okay. Maybe. Your guide, maybe. Maybe. Okay, probably. So can your guide come forward? To, to participate in this conversation, is this a man or a woman, or neither or both? I think it's um, one of those um, angelic, non-sexual men, male. Oh, okay, very good. I know a few. I'm kidding. Okay, very good. And, and uh, <laughs> do we have a name that we can use to address you? I'm not getting something too easily here. That's an unusual name. Okay, <laughs> okay, Mr. Okay, I'm not getting something. Too <laughs> no, so I'm not far? getting. I'm getting an M. Oh, I get it. An I get M, it. but an I'm M. not. All right, let's just call him M. You know, because here's the thing. I I use this term loosely, name, 
it's not their name. This is a name for you. Right. So that you can communicate about what it is they're trying to impart to you. So, M, I appreciate you making yourself known to her. Can you see his features? What does he look like? Um, an angel without wings. Very good. And, um, let me ask you this. When we talk about wings and angels' wings, correct me if I'm wrong, this is a, a mode of transport, the idea that you can shift your consciousness anywhere on the planet, anywhere off the planet, anywhere in the universe, and you're able to move there swiftly. And the wings become like a metaphor for that ability. Is that accurate? Or did you just set your wings down? Um, no, it's relatively accurate. All right, thank you. <laughs> relatively. That's the story of my life. Um, very good. So, M, um, how do you think your your charge is doing? How do you think Farouche is doing? He is says he's, any- he has to he has to he has to kick me in the butt. Very good. Okay, and that's how, I think that's very honest. It's easy to say, "Oh, I'm doing great." Um, and it's important for your audience to hear as well. When I've been doing this, and I've been doing this a long time, 10 years, people generally say, you're doing what you set out to do. You're doing what you signed up for. But sometimes they say, you know, we got to give you a swift, we got to remind you to stay yes. on your path. And, and that's important. It's because it's important to know there's somebody right behind you at all freaking times. No matter where you are, whether you're depressed, lonely, sitting in a hotel room in Paris, thinking about your life, there's someone right over your shoulder going, I'm here. I can help you. And it's important to hear that. Not just, you know, some people will think, oh, she's talking about an angel, but without wings. What is that? Try not to focus on the syntax of what someone's experiencing. It's their experience. I don't. I don't know this M guy, you know, I've never met him, but, but he knows who you are and he knows who your counsel is. And he's, a, he's the one who suggests that you call me because right. he wants you to have this conversation with him. And it's why I said, let's talk to him. You see, so your flip side people are always accessible to you. This information is not foreign or weird. You don't have to be under hypnosis. You just kind of have to open yourself up to it. You open up your heart. I'm sure you probably meditate in your life, so you you're absolutely, tuned. absolutely. So you're tuned to how to do that to open yourself up to see. But listen, what I tell people to focus on is, and everybody, I just want to before we move on, I just want to thank everybody in your council. Well, thank I'm you. I'm sorry to get to everybody, but you know, listen, this is important for Farusha to hear, but and her audience. But that idea that not only are we always protected and always loved, you know, when I talk to people about this experience, and I shared it with the guys at DOPS, what's consistent of, um, among all the research, near-death events, the, uh, the, the events that, you know, between life sessions, and other out-of-body experiences, when I ask them, what was it like, what was the experience like when you got home, they'll say, I felt unconditional love and i think to myself it's not a term that we use on the planet it's because we just we live in an existence of conditional love so the idea that you can experience unconditional i mean some parents have it with their kids and some people have it with their pets sometimes so you can taste it but here people talk about between lives you have an experience of unconditional love wow so this work that we're doing is to really, I think, remind people that there is a place and there are people who love them unconditionally. You can do everything wrong and you will still be loved. Well, you know, you seem to indicate that um, there are lives on other planets, other spheres and so on. So uh, do those entities also have protective um souls, yeah, councils, and so on. And do they yeah, ever interact? I was, I was, I was shocked to, to, to hear that. I thought, oh, maybe it's just humans. But within this research, it appears to be universal, the process. Whether it's a person 
incarnating on this planet or some other planet. They have councils. They And I've spoken to council members, just like we've done, where they say, so a council member says, well, I'll ask, have you ever incarnated with our friend here? And they'll say, no. And I'll say, have you ever incarnated anywhere? And they'll say, yeah, somewhere else. And then I'll say, what was that place like? And they'll describe some other completely unusual environment. The point is only, you know, not to parse, like, where are they? But it's the point is, everybody goes through this kind of process. And I think from, you know, my limited experience i mean i've interviewed i've interviewed pets of people <laughs> pets who passed away pets that i knew who passed away and in a session like this asked can we access your information like what was your journey and process why did you choose this life why did you choose this person in your life it's fascinating because you do get these answers of yeah I, I chose this person and, you know, we lived together in the 1700s and I was his horse and then I was his dog in his life. I don't know. I think it's important. Do for us animals to not move over to humans and back and forth in, on Earth? Well, in general, in general, no. In Newton's, Newton's research, he said never. However, I found in my research that occasionally someone will come forward and say, and in fact, Scott to Tamble, I mentioned earlier, lightbetweenlives.com, he had an experience with somebody who insisted that they had been in a fox in a previous lifetime. Mm, nice. Wild. Well, and, well, but well, here's the thing. When you choose a lifetime, you have to get everybody in your soul group to agree mm. that you're going to, that this is how I was going to help you and them. Mm. In this particular case, though, Scott, and sometimes people are able to do this, while this person was under deep hypnosis and examining this very specific lifetime where the fences were, where the hutch was, you know, who they were mated with, et cetera, et cetera. He said, well, let's go to a previous lifetime before that life. Let's examine that. And that person said, oh, I was an Arctic fox. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I, all I can say is you, uh, you try not to judge what people are saying. Remember, like I said about Padmas and Baba. Yes. He's the one guy who had that experience. So I'd need to find two people who had this experience. In my case, when I first began the research, and I mentioned it in the book flip side, I interviewed an Oxford professor who had a previous life memory of being in Boston in the 1840s, married to a woman that he knows from this life. And so I said as an experiment, have you told this friend about this experience you had, this past life memory? He said, no. I said, well, then if you allow me. So I found a hypnotherapist in New York City who didn't know anything about this guy's past life memory. He did a session with her and she had the identical past life memory being married to this guy in Boston in the 1840s. Wow. So when you find two people who have the identical memory, so let's say someone comes to you and says, I, you know, I have this recurring dream that I was an eagle. You can say, so let's talk to your eagle family. Let's talk to your mom. Let's talk to your dad. Let's talk to your children. What's going on here? Sometimes you find out, you know, there's a, a Tibetan a meditation from the six yogas of Naropa, just a casual reference, mm -hmm. but where people can, monks, practice on shifting their consciousness out of their head and into another a creature. Absolutely, an yes. So, but I, I'm, I'm thinking that it, it's like a temporary thing. I can tell you, I had the experience, I was interviewing, I was doing a between life session, deep hypnosis, this had to be like my third or fourth session, and I was being asked questions about my guide, and Scott DeTamble, at this point, I had done it with different hypnotherapists, he said, well, let me ask your guide, how did you come to be Rich's guide? And in my conscious mind, I felt my consciousness shift out of me into him. And now I was speaking from his perspective about me. And he took us to an event that I saw in my first deep hypnosis session where I was talking to my counsel, just the way you were. But now I'm in his head and he's describing me talking to my counsel. And I'm seeing myself from that weird perspective, wow. seeing myself over there talking. But then what's funny about it is that 
when I did the first session, when I did the original one, I had told a joke to my council and they had all laughed. In my mind's eye, they were roaring with laughter. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I'm killing over here. <laughs> here it is two years later. I'm now having this visual of seeing myself talking to the council and I told that joke and they chuckled. <laughs> it wasn't. And roaring. It, what's, what's unusual is that my guide was aware that I was seeing it from his perspective. And he said, you know, we love Rich, but, you know, we've seen him a lot over here. <laughs> we've heard his jokes before, well, you know, so it's it. <coughs> anyway, it's it, just it, a weird way of saying consciousness isn't what we think it is. It appears to be more of a liquid medium yes. that can sh and move and, and inhabit. Well, and, that's and, almost what you say, Farusha, all the time, that there's this large plane of consciousness throughout the universe. And so what you're saying is that just people, animals, whatever, just pop in and out of it, sort of like a, a, like a frothy am, quantum but, sea, you yes, know, really, yes, yes, am, which is am, really interesting. But mm -hmm. I am saying, yes, if you think of consciousness as water, so then, correct, there is an ocean of consciousness out there. However, we have our own particular little ponds of glass, let's say, of water, that is us. So we can experience what everybody else is feeling. We're all connected, but there is us. It's got all our memories, all our previous lifetimes. We live them in a linear fashion, because otherwise we wouldn't learn any lessons if we didn't do so. That water, then two-thirds of it stays home. So a third of it comes out and goes into the incarnation and spends the time here examining, having fun, talking, blah blah blah. Well, do you and ever then, do you ever become a counsel for somebody else? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Do you ever become somebody else's guide or counsel? I've never had that experience. No, I have had the experience of waking from a dream and feeling like I had been arguing on someone's behalf in front of a counsel. Hmm. I, I've, I've never run across that occupation, but I, I was aware that the argument I was making was that this person should be able to change their life agreement, their contract, because they wanted to stick around longer. And even though it would disrupt everybody else's part of the play, that because they were learning and had learned certain things, that this would help everybody else. And as uh, the, the awareness that I had was I was walking away with like my fellow attorney mm -hmm. and saying, well, we'll see if that worked. So I, I have no idea what that meant other than I was just aware of that. What so if, I, I, what if I somebody think, doesn't want to come back? Well, there you go. You have to make the argument. So here's the thing. If what these people are saying, and that's not what I'm saying, if what people these people are saying is true, that we make an agreement to come here and we work it out. And basically we say, look, we're going to, I'm going to play the role of the cranky old uncle who is an alcoholic. You've asked me to play this role. And I, I even, I said, no, we can say no to a role. I've seen this quite often. We have free will. We can say, no, I don't want to do that again. I did that in the Viking era. I'm tired of it. But let's say you convince me, I can't learn this lesson unless you because you're so good at it, play the cranky drunk uncle. So I agree. I come, and I'm the cranky drunk uncle. And at some point, I start to say, God, I've done this so many times, and I'm wasting my journey, because this is so exciting to be on the planet, to breathe, to have cappuccino. You know what? I'm going to get sober. I'm going to change the third act. The third act was going to be me jumping off a cliff. I'm changing the third act. I'd like to put the weapon down. And I now have a conversation with my counsel. And I say, look, guys, I know I agreed to come back to help people on this other level, but I think I can learn more here. It didn't let me stay. They can say, I don't know. They, I guess I can't imagine them saying no. But they could. They could say, look, you're screwing it up for everybody else. You know, you have to, you have to come back so that these other people can come forward or they can help you. You're cheating them out of their lesson. One of my major jokes, and just as an aside, is that uh, I always tell people I, I don't care to come back uh, to this planet, and I think I'd rather go to that 
fluffy pink and purple pillow planet with the lovely pink kittens bouncing up and down with me really? in, that, in, in that in uh, that planet. Um, well, can I just say that my friends, uh, you know, and I've heard this often, they go, yeah, okay, that's great for about an hour. <laughs> and then you get bored. Listen, I come from theater and drama. Conflict is the essence of drama. Yes. You don't have a good play unless you have drama. And you can't have drama unless there's conflict. So you need that to be entertained. And if you, you could go to the Fluffy Pink Planet, but when you're done there, all your friends are going to be like, really? You made me watch your guys like you made me watch that. <laughs> well, for like, well, who exactly are these council? I mean, they're obviously not. They don't reincarnate. Would well, they just stay up there and counsel you? Or? Well, everybody I'm, I'm has little, their uh, own. Everybody has their own council. Yes. And who are they? You've earned them. You've earned their role on your council. Go from going through a difficult lifetime, maybe oh. compassion, maybe what we learned. Those two things that she had on her council, but. I've recently come to learn, this was not in Newton's work, because I asked. Council members serve on other people's councils. Mm. So, like, I'm here we are knocking on the door. We just asked your council to show up, and they were all there. Right? Right. But they could have been busy doing something else when, you know, Rich is knocking on the door. Like, come on, we want to talk to you. Is it temporal, though? I would imagine that sort of temporal um, situation is not uh, is not necessarily uh, well, viable. You know, I would I say mean, there's they a could time be in two construct. places at once, or that 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 once you're out of the body, time is uh, is yeah, not of the right. essence. Well, exactly. Once you're outside of time, I've had this experience. Once you're outside of time, then you can sort of. Like, if you think of time as a sphere, right? This is the Earth's sphere of time. You can sort of poke your finger in over here and be in that century. You can poke your finger over here and be in this century. So you're in both places simultaneously, you see? Plus, you have this thing of your consciousness is not finite into one particular thing. A third comes here. I asked once, well, does that mean the other part of my consciousness could be incarnating with somebody else and they answered do the math so some of your consciousness could be different places at the same time sure because if a third is here roughly people if you ask people like how much of your consciousness do you bring they'll say anywhere between 20 and 40 percent but that oh so back to your answer your question about the classrooms all these classrooms i've visited and like i say i've visited Oh, maybe four or five, maybe more. Every classroom I've gone into, they're teaching something about the transference of energy, how energy gets transferred or transformed, either from thought into objects. They claim that they're helping other planets in distant places to accommodate life. So they're using thought and mathematics to create life in distant planets as they did here at some point. And so that those creatures that come to life will accommodate consciousness. What do you, do you think of the idea of uh, distant mental influencing or remote influencing by humans to other humans, all of us here on Earth? There is a, I've heard this often, there's a sacrosanct law. And the law is you cannot interfere. So that's why we haven't had aliens come here. That's why even though we have people all over the planet. However, I must tell you, in my research, I've actually in Michael Newton's research, 10% uh, of all the people that he saw, I don't know, thousands of people, claimed to have off-life experience, off-world experience, off-planet experience in other planets. That number has risen to 30%, according to Pete Smith, who I interviewed in my second book, It's a Wonderful Afterlife. Pete Smith said that number has risen to 30%. So that either means 30% of the people that are on the planet are coming to explain why they're here. This is like their first time here. So my point is, the whole a concept of aliens coming here, they're here. They've incarnated as humans. They normally incarnate somewhere else. So the question is, 
why? Why are you coming here? What's your what's your journey? Why are you here? And they say, kind of consistently, to alter the consciousness of the planet, to help the shift, help shift consciousness so people can understand that we don't die, that we can access other worlds, that it's time for us to appreciate this information. Well, what I was going to mention there is that the population of the Earth, as we are told, I mean, I assume that it's true, has increased vastly, uh, you know, geometrically yeah. over time. So these souls have to be coming from somewhere if in well, fact... They, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Correct. But the other part of the equation is souls are created outside of time. So the uh, process of a soul coming into being has nothing to do with the Big Bang. So has nothing it, to do uh, with what? I'm sorry, I missed the, that. The Big Bang has nothing to do with the Big Bang. In other words, there have been many Big Bangs, okay, according to what people Good say. Deal. And a soul can come into existence at any time. Like there, oh, <laughs> there's another one. They can come into existence and show up here. It's not a finite amount of souls to be accessed. But I agree with you. You could argue that the reason 30% of the people who show up under deep hypnosis to have claim to have off-life experience, off-world experience, must be, you know, because they're taking the place of somebody who might have come here. I don't know. All I know is, the, if you look at 10 people, three of them have had some experience on another planet. And we all know who those people might be in our lives, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I I, I once took a trip to Mexico with a friend of mine, uh, an, another lady, and she had uh, consistent dreams of being on another, in another existence on another planet. And she was a lovely person, but if you met her, you would understand it. Right, right. There you go. Hello. Yeah. So... You know, but listen, I, I, you know, the big thing that I've learned in this, the big things, but one of the main things I've learned is to try not judge people for their past. We have no idea what it's like to be in their shoes. We have no idea why they chose this path. The only way we can find out is to ask them. Exactly. And, and what I've been doing in the past three years is I work with a medium, Jennifer Schaefer, out of Manhattan Beach. She works with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. She's very good at what she does. And what I came to the idea of, like, well, if, pe if it's what people are saying in their near-death experience or deep hypnosis is accurate, then wouldn't it make sense that if somebody can talk to them, we could verify that? And so I focus mostly on people that I knew who are no longer here so I can verify what they're saying. So I'll ask them the question, who was the first person to greet you when you got over there? It's not an answer I would know, or Jennifer could possibly know, but their family might, because they'll say, yeah, I saw my uncle with the uh, one arm, the soldier that you served in World War I. That's who greeted me. And then I talked to the family. I said, did you guys have an Uncle John who served in World War I? He's missing an arm. Yes, we did. So I've been doing that for three years. and I'm Fascinating. Just uh, I put the book together. It's called uh, Backstage Pass, which came from one of the people we were talking to who said, you know, talking to us in this manner is like having a backstage pass. You get a chance to talk to anybody, anywhere. It's a fascinating topic because I just try to focus on the things that I can verify. Well, that, every, uh, well, everything you said has been truly fascinating, and so I think it's time for us to let the audience know the names of your books and where they can Films help. and your yeah, all website, all that good stuff. I know, the flip side was cool. That was nice. Yeah, we enjoyed that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you enjoyed that. I apologize. It, you know, I made it on my computer here. It's not, you know, like a typical film. But Looks pretty Gaia good. Owns Looks good. Flipside. Looks good. Thank you. Gaia owns Flipside now, and so they have it on their website. Uh, I think you can find it on Amazon for streaming, whatever. The book is called Flipside, A Tourist Guide on How to Navigate the Afterlife. I'm the tourist. And then the next two books were called uh, It's a Wonderful Afterlife. It was Very so clever. much information, I put them into two. Uh, they're scientists. They're Bruce Grayson and other scientists weigh in on consciousness. So they can talk about consciousness quite a bit, near-death experiences. And the fourth book is called Hacking the Afterlife, which <laughs> is sort of the kind of stuff I've been doing with Jennifer Schaefer, where I'm accessing people who used to be here and asking them for help. 
Like, how do we fix the planet? How do we, you know, if you could talk to a physicist over there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he had a problem over here, like, wouldn't it be great if I could ask him, how do we make salt water cheap for fresh water cheaply? Uh, you know, stuff like that. So well, I find it very, I very interesting how some scientists over the course of time have received their theories in, uh, in dream state. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Tesla especially. Tesla and, and even Watson and, and Crick was and chasing the tail of the... Yeah. Watson and Crick, sure. Yeah. yeah. So that's, sure, and Beethoven ahead. talked no, wait, about... Watson the, and Crick wasn't a cat chasing tail. That was a guy with the carbon, the cyclical <laughs> carbon molecules. Cat. It could be Schrodinger's cat was uh, chasing his tail in no, a box. Oh, no, no. <laughs> you, well, you don't know until you open that box. Uh -huh. No, it's true. Well, you know, in Tesla's case, it's very unusual because, as you know, he fell from his horse, fell from a horse when he was a young kid. And after that experience, he started to be able to visualize things in his head. Mm -hmm. So was it the fall that helped him alter the frequency? But, you know, here was a guy who could visualize the drawings and mm. his things yeah. completely. I did write a screenplay that over the years, there's been many screenwriters and filmmakers like myself who have, you know, been touched by Tesla's work. Mm -hmm. At some point, I real I got very close to making a, a film about Edison and Tesla. You should. And Morgan. I well, I you know honestly. Well, you're uh, the one talking about why. conflict and drama. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. Conflict that was that was a, yeah. Om Seti. Om Seti, uh, who was an English woman um, earlier in the 20th century, uh, fell down the stairs in her London home when she was a teenager, and uh -huh. when she. Uh, came to and, uh, be, you know, she discovered that she had had another life in Egypt and she went to Egypt and she stayed at the, uh, the uh, I don't know if it was the tomb or the temple of Seti, the first, oh. and she uh, kept the temple till the end of her life. She uh, swept it, and she basically lived on the grounds. Mm. And she was a British woman. I think she might have been born around the turn of the century and probably died during the 1960s. I could be off uh, by, you know, a number of years on that. But there's a very interesting book called The Search for Om Seti that uh, well, also great. has well, a, uh, a fall f uh, from the top of the cellar steps. She fell down, and when she... Uh, got better from her fall. She uh, could not get herself out of the Egyptian wing of the British Museum. And eventually, when she gained her majority, she went to Egypt to live for the rest of her life. Hmm. Well, it, here's the interesting about that. If, if you look at Bruce Grayson did a talk uh, in Dharamsala called Is Consciousness Produced by the Brain? If you just Google that on YouTube, it's about an hour long. He talks about the cases in the UK, hospice workers reporting how people who had severe Alzheimer's suddenly regain memory just prior to passing. Right. It's like they, they come back to normalcy, and then they die. Terminal they lucidity, yes. Yeah, and they do the autopsy, and the brain is atrophied to a point where they shouldn't have been able to access these things. His idea that it's possible that the filters that are in place that prevent us from accessing previous lifetimes or all of our memory or all these details die as the brain dies. So it could be in relation to what you're saying, people who have a fall or a car accident or something that alters their frequency, the reception of frequency, so that they can access these other memories, which is what they are memories. I would offer that if I had known Om, Om Seti, I would have said, now look, you chose this lifetime. But it wasn't to go sweep up in some place you used to live back in the old days. You chose it because you could learn, have fun and enjoy and breathe and, and, you know, entertain yourself. And I know you feel more comfortable in this thing, but, you know, I, I'm fond of saying, you know, I'm very familiar with Tibetan uh, concept of reincarnation. And so, you know, monks who remember previous lifetimes, and then these monks show up at your door, knock, knock, knock. Okay, we want to take you back to the monastery. The answer is, I'm sorry, I chose this lifetime so that I could experience this. Not that. I used to do that. And I can, sure. But I want to experience this. One of the... Uh 
uh, not the, the Dalai Lama, but one of the other lineage lamas, and I don't know which what the name is, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, he said he has decided to come back in the next life as a um, just a boy in Spain or something like that. It was rather interesting why he had chose that. Rich, I want you to mention all your books again because we have to unfortunately wrap it up at this mm -hmm. point. No, but we have totally, totally we have totally you've had enjoyed. all the fun you're going to oh, have. Man. Sorry, and we'll go, we'll, we'd love <laughs> to right. have you back on another time. Anytime, that's fabulous. Okay. Uh, yes, so my books. Here's one. I don't know if you can see that. Hacking the Afterlife. Okay, that's available everywhere, and that's the most recent one. And then you've got Flipside, the movie and the book, and it's a wonderful afterlife. By the way, the volume two, the introduction was written by a young man who passed away. Mm -hmm. And I spoke with his father in a medium. He had written his own book. His name is Galen Stoller. And I asked Galen to write the introduction. So it's a fascinating introduction mm -hmm. written by somebody not on the planet wow. about what it's like for him. Wow. That wow. is interesting. That is very interesting. So, um, once again, thank you, Rich Martini. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing us to view uh, the flip side. We really enjoyed it, and um, we're going to say goodbye for now. Yes, thanks and again, thanks Rich. for letting me speak to your counsel, Farusha. Okay. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right. Very good. Uh, uh, Cheers. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, that was really fascinating. It really was very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, he brought out a lot of interesting points. Well, I, I mentioned this at work, and they said, oh, so he's talking about purgatory. And in a sense, yeah, I guess, you know, I mean, before you either achieve a bad life or a good life, you hang out in purgatory. Or, you know, it, so I guess it's not quite that old an idea. And then you have to think, well... As he said, time is all over the place, so perhaps this idea of his was uh, apparent back in the Middle Ages. Certainly possible. Mm. Um, in any case... Yes. Um, I don't have a council, by the way, I don't think. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. Oh, well, we'll, we'll have to... We'll have hypnotize you no 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 that's sleepy. okay yeah, no 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 but, oh. yeah but yeah but you, you, i really enjoyed that I, f yeah. I found it to be extremely interesting he's a great speaker yeah he's he's very persuasive mm -hmm. i must say um in any case uh this i believe is our 70th show is Oof. that possible i think no. it's our 70th really and um please remember to like us on our Facebook page, Shattered because Reality. Counsel their council tells them to, right? Yes, their ca your mm -hmm. councils tell you to like mm -hmm. us on, on your Facebook page, oh. on our Facebook page, oh, like yeah. us on either of or both of our and, and websites. And if they don't, we'll really pick a really good reincarnation spot oh, for them. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> you better like us. <laughs> um, so also on, um, on YouTube, where most mm -hmm. of our... Uh, podcasts are hanging out as well and we yeah. really get some fabulous numbers on youtube mm -hmm. and uh, uh before you came i we i was saying that a lovely australian woman was telling us on the facebook a message mm -hmm. how she liked the show great and um what happened was that Facebook stole the message. Once I sent her back the really? message, her message disappeared. Hmm. So I think her name was Maxine, but I'm not sure. So hello out there. And um, thank you also uh -huh. to my client who introduced me to the Michael Newton work. It's very interesting. I don't know entirely what to make of it, but I am going to study it further. And uh, what uh, do you have any other? Uh, nope. I would say nope, only good. one other thing. If you have, if you are a listener, and you have had a paranormal experience, and would like to share it with us on Shattered Reality Podcast, generally we do this at the last fifteen minutes of the show, mm -hmm. and we've had quite a few listeners who've already participated, and we don't make fun of anybody. We are really there for you, and we want to hear what you perceive is going on in your life that is of a paranormal nature. Right. So, once again... Okay. Goodbye, goodbye from, from Shattered, Shattered Reality. reality.